Good day, I'm Norman Wildberger. And today we're going to have some interesting connections from mathematics to the reality of the world around us, the physical reality of the world around us. So these two things are more connected than we might at first think. We like to think that mathematics is an abstract intellectual activity, largely independent of the world. But in fact, when we look more closely, we see that we're really obliged to write mathematics down. So we need some space to write mathematics down. And so questions about limitations of space are actually relevant for us, especially when we start looking at very large numbers, which is what we've been doing in the last few videos. So we're going to see that there is problems arising here when we start to face the fact that we actually live in a universe which is bounded in a very intrinsic way. Okay, so we've been talking about large numbers and the complexity of large numbers, how efficiently we can write numbers down using basic arithmetical operations. We've seen that, for example, a number like z equals 10 triangle 10 plus 23 is very efficiently written using this triangle notation. I remind you that the triangle notation means a tower of 10 tens. This means 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10, altogether 10 tens stacked up on top of each other in terms of exponents of exponents. And that most of the numbers less than z have the property that their complexity is actually rather large. In particular, much larger than 10 triangle 4, which is already an absurdly large number. That's 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10. We're going to see that this has ramifications for us, because this number, as we'll see, roughly, very roughly, is sort of commensurable with the potential possibilities for writing expressions down in our universe, at least according to our modern view of how big the universe is. And this leads us to very interesting problems. So it suggests to us that we may have to reconsider a little bit the nature of numbers, what we actually mean by a number. We're going to see that the logical validity of much of number theory is perhaps thrown into question. And we'll see that size, memory, and energy limitations in our world actually has something to do with mathematics. These two things are not independent. So for most of the videos in this series, I'm being very careful and precise about mathematics and laying it out in a very clear, I hope, uh, way. But every so often, like in this video, we're going to go out a little bit and sort of have a wider view, maybe talk about some adjacent disciplines. That will be necessary and useful for us. So today we're going to touch on some meta-mathematical issues. Maybe we could say scientific aspects or philosophical uh, aspects of this, uh, this kind of question of complexity and large size of things. So when it comes to the philosophy of mathematics, there are, of course, many schools of thought about the nature of mathematics. But historically, the leading school is almost certainly Platonism. It's almost a kind of default position that working mathematicians have, which is very roughly that mathematics lives in an abstract or otherworldly realm, which mirrors this world, but is separate from it. Okay? So here is our world with planets and suns and particles and cells and creatures and so on. And Somewhere else, there's this abstract world of mathematics where we have these ideal objects, numbers and functions and conics and all the various aspects of pure mathematics. And then there's this idea that there's some kind of mysterious and beautiful connection between this abstract world of mathematics and our own very concrete world. Okay. So this is a very familiar view, and it's a very natural view, and one, in fact, that I have a lot of sympathy with. So that as you explore mathematics in our world, you can't help but, but realize that there are these remarkable things that are happening that seem to be happening sort of independent of actual physical things. But this is not the only 
possible point of view that one can have about what mathematics is, of course. So Platonism is named after Plato, the great Greek thinker and writer, lived from 424 to 347 BC. And he had a student, Aristotle, lived from 384 to 322 BC, who perhaps ultimately had an even greater influence on the development of science and logic and um, perhaps mathematics. And in recent years, a new kind of philosophy of mathematics, called an Aristotelian realist philosophy of mathematics, has been developed by the so-called Sydney School of Mathematical Philosophers, led by James Franklin, my colleague at the University of New South Wales. And this theory has been laid out in this 2014 book of Jim's, An Aristotelian Realist Philosophy of Mathematics, Mathematics as the Science of Quantity and Structure, by Paul Grave Macmillan. And in it, Franklin proposes that there is a way of thinking about mathematics as connecting more with the real world. That mathematics is really contained in applied mathematics, and that the patterns of mathematics, the equations of mathematics, the ideal objects of mathematics, actually have a life in the physical world. So he writes, mathematics is a direct science of structural features of the real world, like symmetry, continuity, and ratios. So he's looking to place mathematics in the actual world, basically through what we usually call applied mathematics. Now, I've been thinking about uh, James's position, and I actually have quite a lot of sympathy with it. I may not agree with him entirely about everything. In fact, we had a debate about the nature of infinity that may be familiar to you. But I think there's a lot of, of good idea here in this alternative to Platonism. The idea of really grounding mathematics in our reality as opposed to some ideal reality that's out there somewhere, you know, in some space outside of our own physical universe. And so this kind of feet on the ground kind of approach appeals to me, and I think it, uh, it really ought to be considered as a serious contender for thinking about and positioning mathematics. And it's sort of from this point of view that I'm going to be talking about today, so not exactly following exactly Jim's uh, point of view, and I don't claim to have read this or understood the entire argument, but just a general orientation uh, in this Aristotelian uh, direction of trying to link mathematics with what actually happens in the real world. So I do have a lot of sympathy with a real-world view of the foundations of mathematics, and it also accords, in my view, with some basic principles of science. So in science, we generally agree that scientific objects need to be observable. A scientist wants to be able to register something about an object before he or she will admit that there actually is an object there. Things which are invisible, you can't hear them, you can't see them, you can't feel them, and they don't register at all on your instruments in any way at all. The scientist has a reluctance to take those things into their theories. They would rather have theories that are populated by things that one can actually observe. And correspondingly, I think there's an argument to be made that mathematical objects need to be expressible. It's kind of the mathematical equivalent of scientific objects need to be observable. Mathematical objects need to be expressible. We need to be able to write something down to express a mathematical idea, be it a formula, a set, a pattern, a more complicated object. We want to be able to write something down so that we can show it to other people, that people can critically look at it to make sure that it actually makes sense. Just having something that's a kind of an idea that we don't actually pin down concretely is not really completely adequate, from my view. So, with this orientation, I'd like to now sort of pose some questions for us to think about. The first question is, do numbers exist if they can't be expressed or written down? We can express the number 1437 
We can write down 1, 4, 3, 7. We've expressed that number. We can argue that it exists in some form or another because we can point to that actual physical representation on the page. We might be able to represent it in other ways as well, but there are at least some ways of representing that number. But what about numbers, perhaps numbers in quotes, which cannot be actually expressed or written down? There's something different about them, and do they really deserve to be part of the mathematical world? And this leads us to the question, does the physical size of the universe limit the mathematics that is possible in it? If we insist that mathematics is written down, then we need some space to write things down. We need some room, whether it's a piece of paper or a file on a computer, but we need some space in order to express our ideas. And then we run into the possibility that we might end up considering things which are so big that there's not actually enough room in the universe, in the physical universe that we're living in here, to express those objects. At which point we're back to this kind of question of what exactly are we talking about? If we're talking about something which cannot be written down or expressed in our universe, then are we really talking about mathematics? Or is it some more voodoo-like subject? So this line of reasoning, I think, naturally leads us to the interesting question of how big is the universe? We want to maybe estimate just how much room is there to write something down in our universe. So I'm now going to make a little bit of discussion here about physical aspects of our universe and we're going to make some very crude and rough estimates. I'm not claiming to be completely accurate here and the accuracy as you'll see is not entirely important. We just want to get ballpark estimates for things. So we don't really know how big the universe is. That's a fact, okay? But we do have estimates and we do have theories about the development of the universe that allow us to give approximate ideas of how much big it might actually be. And I think current uh, ideas of cosmology put the universe's size as roughly about 100 billion light years across. Okay, so that's a very large distance. I remind you that a light year is the extent that a photon can travel in a year. So a photon goes very fast, takes eight minutes for it to get from the sun to here on planet Earth, for example, and that's eight minutes. And then if you let that same photon keep going for an entire year, it obviously goes quite far, and that's called a light year. And it's a kind of convenient measure for measuring intergalactic uh, you know, spatial kind of things. So roughly 100 billion light years. Now a billion is 10 to the 9, so 100 billion light years would be 10 to the 11 light years. Now how much is a light year? Well a light year is about 10 to the 16 meters. So a meter is you know, maybe something like this and it's a little bit bigger than a yard if you're uh, the American system. A yard plus 3 inches roughly is a meter. So 10 to the 16 meters in a light year, and there's 100 billion light years roughly across the universe. So we have this very naive picture of the size of the universe. We can model it very roughly by a cube, a cube whose side is around 10 to the 30 meters. Because 10 to the 11 light years, each light year is 10 to the 16 meters, so that's altogether 10 to the 27 meters. Just multiply those two together, and 10 to the 7 is approximately 10 to the 30. All right. So there's a picture of our universe, greatly simplified. And we'll think of it as a cube with sides 10 to the 30 meters. So we've talked about how big things can get. But it's also important for us to ask about how small things can get. Because in terms of information, 
as we know with our computers. It's not just a question of how big the computers are, it's also a question of how efficiently we can compress data or bits, how efficiently small we can make hard drives, for example. So we can ask the question, how small can things get? Well, a very small thing is an atom. And an atom, say hydrogen or helium, may be 10 to the minus 10 meters. Okay. Now, most of that atom is sort of empty space. The actual ingredients of the atom, like a proton or neutron or electron, are, of course, much smaller. A proton or neutron is roughly about 10 to the minus 15 meters in size. And an electron is even smaller, about 10 to the minus 18 uh, meters. And in terms of subdividing a proton, well, we have this idea that a proton is made of things called quarks. So here's a proton with an up, up, down quark. And a quark is some yet smaller, more elementary kind of object, which no one actually has seen. We don't really have direct evidence of individual quarks all by themselves, but there's a lot of indirect evidence to support their existence. And we can sort of estimate that there may be about 10 to the minus 20 meters. So that's sort of the smallest kind of object uh, that we have. But there's another kind of a smallness that's important in physics, and that's what's called the Planck scale. That's an even smaller amount of space, 10 to the minus 35, and that's a very important uh, number. So that's sort of the smallest scale that you can get to before quantum effects prohibit resolution. So as you get to smaller and smaller things, quantum mechanics plays a greater, greater role in determining what's going on, and the physics of the very, very small is wildly different from the physics that we're used to here on planet Earth in our realm of things. And it's sort of understood that there's some kind of limit to how small you can get, how fine you can resolve things. You know, the wavelength of light, for example. Uh, and there's a, something called an uncertainty principle. So once you get to very small distances, you can't separate effectively the, even the space, or even theoretically anymore. And this is generally around 10 to the minus 35. So the kind of a graininess of space occurs at this level. This is the smallest kind of resolution that's possible. Um, not just as a consequence of the power of our instruments, it's really somehow hardwired into the nature of space itself. It's just some obstacle that nature has that prevents us or anyone from delving deeper into the nature of space, rather deeper than this particular resolution level. So let's consider an abstract cube, which we'll call a Planck cube just a theoretical idea of a very, very tiny cube of space, which is the smallest possible sort of resolution size possible before quantum mechanical effects just disintegrate everything. So here's a little cube and it's got side 10 to the minus 35 meters. So that's a very, very small cube. And so let's perform the following calculation. That imagine that we have a one meter square cube. So one meter, all right, by one meter, by one meter. All right, you can have a big, big box, but not that big. And let's ask, how many Planck cubes could we fill this thing with? All right, so there's our meter cube, and we're subdividing it into lots of uh, little segments, each 10 to the minus 35 uh, wide. So there's one of many little Planck cubes that we've cut our big one meter box into. So how many such cubes are there gonna be? Well, that's pretty simple because there's 10 to the 35 cubes that'll be arranged along any one of these dimensions. And there are these three dimensions. So we have to take 10 to the 35 times 10 to the 35 times 10 to the 35, which is approximately 10 to the 100. Okay, maybe it's a little bit more, but I don't really care. I'm just interested in ballpark estimates here. That's roughly 10 to the 100 such cubes can be fit into a one meter box. And now let's ask a similar kind of question relating the size of the universe with these meter 
boxes. How many meter cubes could we fit into the universe? So we've said that the universe is roughly 10 to the 30 meters across. So here's our universe and here's a little meter box. And in any one dimension there are say 10 to the 30 such boxes lined up. So there's 10 to the 30, 10 to the 30, 10 to the 30. So altogether 10 to the 30 times 10 to the 30 times 10 to the 30, which is also roughly 10 to the 100 such boxes. So this is kind of interesting, first of all, that going from our scale, arguably, you know, a cube box is very much in our world, going from that to the very smallest possible cube, a Planck cube, is a factor of 10 to the 100. And going from our meter cube to the very biggest scale, that of the entire universe itself, is also roughly of the order of factor of 10 to the 100. So from this sort of logarithmic power exponent point of view, we, or the scale that we're at, are roughly balanced between the very smallest things that one can imagine in our universe and the very biggest thing, which is the universe itself. We are somehow in the middle. And now let's put this together by asking how many of these Planck cubes could we fit into the entire universe? So we can fit 10 to the 100 of these Planck cubes into a meter box, and we can fit 10 to the 100 meter boxes into the universe, and so we can fit 10 to the 100 times 10 to the 100, which is 10 to the 200, Planck cubes into our universe. Very roughly, okay? Very roughly. So this is a very, very rough estimate based on our current understanding of the size of the universe. And this should be taken with a grain of salt, but it's probably not wildly inaccurate in terms of our current knowledge. So now I want to talk about being able to write something down in our universe. How much information can we store in our universe? I'm interested in an upper bound. I'm interested in the maximum possible. So here's a hard drive, which will be kind of familiar to you. These days, right, hard drive like this is uh, maybe a terabyte. Okay, that's uh, a lot of data. But we could well imagine expanding a hard drive, making a bigger one, and we can fit more and more data in. And perhaps the ultimate kind of hard drive that one can at least imagine, of course we could never make this, but we can at least perhaps contemplate it, is a hard drive that is so vast that it fills the entire universe, and which is so fine that we are allowed to write data, not at the atomic level, but at the Planck scale level. So imagine a entirely fictitious hard drive which occupies the entire universe and where we're able to write one of K symbols in each Planck cube. We've seen that the universe roughly has 10 to the 200 Planck cubes. It could be subdivided into 10 to the 200 Planck cubes. And now imagine that in each one of these 10 to the 200 Planck cubes we can write one of K symbols. Okay. K possibilities for that Planck cube, K possibilities for the cube beside it, K possibilities for the cube beside it. And for each of the 10 to the 200 Planck cubes, we can write a symbol down. This is some kind of very efficient, this is a much more efficient hard drive than, than, than we have on our computers now. This is enormously efficient because we're cramming these things in at such a, a scale. So how many possible fillings are there? How many possible ways can we fill this hard drive with these K types of symbols? Well, the answer is K times K times K times K and so on, all together 10 to the 200 times. In other words, it's K to the 10 to the 200. That's the total number of ways that we can fill our hard drive. It's the total number of expressions that we're able to write down. The total number of possibilities in terms of 
these k symbols in our universe. Now, if k is 16, which we've been talking about, we have this particular alphabet of our 10 digits with a few operations and some brackets, so 16, then this is 16 to the 10 to the 200. And I want to estimate this. And I want to introduce some slack. So let's replace the 16 with 100. So maybe we'll allow some more symbols. Some subtraction sign, perhaps, maybe a division sign, maybe some factorial, and maybe a few you know, other kinds of mathematical symbols that we might want to introduce. So we have 100 symbols now, and so the total number of words or expressions is now less than or equal to 100 to the 10 to the 200. Now 100 is 10 squared. So if we use our laws of exponents, this is really 10 squared to the 10 to the 200, then it's really multiplying this exponent by 2. So it's really 10 to the 2 times 10 to the 200. Okay, so 2 times 10 to the 200, I'm going to replace that with something that's quite a lot bigger. I'm going to replace it with 10 to the 1,000. Right, so you will agree that 2 times 10 to the 200 is a lot less than 10 to the 1,000. Because I want to, you know, I want to have a lot of room. I want this to be a reasonable estimate. So I don't want anybody arguing, well, you haven't counted this quite uh, well enough. So I'm expanding this number enormously by going from here to here. So this is a vast increase. So I can very safely say that the total number of expressions that you can write down in our universe using 16 symbols is far less than 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 3. And this is, well, it's bigger than 10 triangle 3. If there wasn't a 3 there, it would be 10 triangle 3. So this is quite a lot bigger than 10 triangle 3. But it's nowhere near 10 triangle 4. 10 triangle 4 would be what would happen if we replace this 3 with a 10. Instead of having 10 cubed, instead of having 1,000 here as an exponent, we would have 10 to the 10, which is 10 billion as the exponent there. Yeah, that would be a huge jump. So this is yet a, another approximation that's saying that the total number of words in our universe, uh, treated as a Planck scale hard drive, is going to be less than 10 triangle 4. And this is uh, very crude, but this is a reason why I think of this number as being somewhat commensurable with the amount of complexity possible in our universe. So our known universe supports at most 10 triangle 4 distinct expressions. This is an upper limit to the number of different things that you can write down, number of different expressions that you can write down. So most of the numbers from 1 to z, z being 10 triangle 10 plus 23, cannot be written down in our universe. This is the claim that I was making a video or two ago. So I was claiming that this number, it's very big, but it's not as big as other numbers that we could easily write down. But it has the property that most of the numbers less than this thing here, we saw that it, their complexity was greater than 10 triangle 4. If their complexity is greater than 10 triangle 4, it means that they cannot be written down. It means these numbers that we're talking about have the property that they're impossible to express in our universe. So conclusion, most of these numbers do not in fact exist. Is this a daring conclusion? They do not in fact exist. They cannot even be defined or specified. We're talking about them in a way that assumes that they already exist. So we, and I have been saying all along that we consider all the numbers from 1 to z, assuming that that already makes sense. But that's now quite questionable. To what extent do these things exist? To what extent does it make sense to talk about all the numbers from 1 to z if most of them are impossible to write down in pretty well any kind of arithmetical system that you can imagine? So the phrase, all the numbers from 1 to z, is problematic or maybe dubious 
or maybe in fact it's just nonsense. So I think this, uh, this line of reasoning, this appreciation that mathematics is something that you have to write down, it's connected with the real world, mathematics which cannot be written down, which cannot be connected with the real world in some fashion or another, is not really mathematics, it's something else. It's some kind of fairy tale, some like some spiritual discussion about the fifth dimension and you know various goblins and ghosts that are there in the fifth dimension. And no one can see them, no one can visualize them, hear them, register them on any kind of scientific instruments. It's just in our minds. That's sort of at the level that we're venturing towards when we talk so confidently about all the numbers from 1 to Z. And then, of course, what about all the numbers from Z to infinity? Well, what about them? Okay. What are we talking about here? Are we making any sense at all? In our next video, we're going to have to go further, and we're going to have to talk about you know, infinity. And does this word have any real meaning in our world? The discussion that we've had today, I think, gives us a firm footing upon which to talk about that. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.